See, God has a way of taking broken pieces and turning them into masterpieces. And for so long, I was broken. And I know that a lot of you are broken because the statistics don't lie. The numbers don't lie. Even though you go to a university, there are still bro- you're still feeling all these emotions. And I've got to tell you that God is there, even when you don't think he's there. See, how I came in this world is a crazy story. My mother was raped. And at, when she told my biological dad, who was just a boyfriend, but that's how she thought she was supposed to be treated, by men. And she told him, I'm pregnant. He says, well, you better go kill that baby. You, go, you better go get an abortion, because if you don't get an abortion, I'll kill that baby. So at three months, no abortion. Six months, no abortion. Thank God. Seven months, my mom is waitressing at a restaurant in San Diego, California, doing her job, waiting on tables. And I'm enjoying myself, swim that amniotic fluid in the warmth of my mother's womb. I have no idea what's going to happen. My dad comes into the restaurant in a fit of rage. He grabs my mother's long blonde hair, grabs my mother, and drags her in front of everybody back into the kitchen. And at seven months pregnant, you got a nice bump there. He throws her to the ground and continues to stomp on her stomach over and over again. But I lived. I lived. I tell people all over this world, from the bottom of the earth, Australia to the top, Northern Territory, Canada, that you have a purpose. As long as there is blood running through your heart, as long as there's air in your lungs, you have a purpose. You have to give meaning to your life. And the Lord has a purpose for you. See, I wouldn't find this purpose, the microphone, until 2008 to share what the Lord has done for me. But for so many years, I thought the Lord hated me, that God hated me. I went through so much brutal child abuse. It shows in my state records that my dad tried to kill me several times. At five years old, my mom and my new stepdad, after suffering brutal abuse from burning me with hot scalding water where my flesh was burned, where my skin was burned, where they tried to drown me in the toilet. And at five years old, my stepdad and my mom loaded me up in the car. And we ended up at this building. We walked in. My mom and dad are talking to some people. And my, I'm just sitting there. And then two people in white coats came over to me and said, Derek, please come with us. They abandoned me at a psychiatric hospital when I was five years old. They kept my brother and sister. So growing up, I always felt like a reject. I always felt like, why did the good kids got to stay with mom and the bad kid got thrown away? From there, I was like a lab rat, like a test monkey, literally a guinea pig. I have copies of all my neurological, the brain exams that they did in the machines, psychological, psychiatric evaluations, speech and language evaluations, and they said I had the IQ of a two-year-old at six years old, that I was overtly psychotic, erratic psychosis, attachment issues, ADHD, all these issues. But still... In your abandonment, God still has a plan for you. He's never abandoned you. But yet, the human side of us is, where are you, God? Where are you? I went through a series of foster homes. And then I'm back at the orphanage, the shelter, we called it. And if I don't find a foster home, I will be sent back to the psychiatric institution where I will stay. I don't normally share this story. I had one foster home left in this county. My social worker called this foster home and says, we've got this cute little kid, he's got a big personality. Would you be willing to try him out? And they weren't looking to be foster parents anymore because being a foster parent is a grieving process. 
You fall in love with this kid, and then you know they go back to an environment where they're molested or abused or all the bad things grow up in a drug house. And they said, you know what, we're just really, we're interested in adopting. But they said, we'll try him out for one weekend because I'm not adoptable based on my emotional behavioral problems. And during that whole weekend, I fell in love with this home on a farm. But before I even arrived there, this foster mom woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning, startled, two weeks before I visit there. She, she woke up and she startled. She sees a blonde little kid with his back against her sitting on her bed. And she's like, who are you? What are you doing in my house? It's 2 o'clock in the morning. She tries to wake up her husband. The husband won't wake up. And she just stares at the back of the, the head of this kid. And then the kid turns around and just stares at her and doesn't say a word for several minutes as she's trying to engage and communicate with him. And then the boy disappears. And two weeks later, I knock on that door with my social worker and my foster mom and my foster dad for that week and open up the door. And my mom in amazement says, that's that little boy. That's that little boy that was in my room. See, God had sent me to that family. And she never gave up on me. Even when I was a crazy teenager, she never changed the locks on the front door. When I got arrested, when I was in so much trouble because your pattern follows you sometimes, you only get better when your life, you get better when your, your life gets better when you get better. And the only way to get better that this world is missing is finding that spiritual connection, that relationship with Jesus. We are connected to that vine. And a lot of us go through life distracted. We don't want to feel. We don't want to feel. I want to share with you a song that I wrote about a homeless man. Do you know in America, 51% of the U.S. homeless population is from aged out kids from foster care? Where I live, California, 74% of the inmates in California prison have been in foster care. I should not be standing here today, the statistics should say. And it would take my make or break moment, 18 years old, when I would finally get it, that I could control my actions, I could control my attitude, I could control my expectations, I could control my thoughts, I could control my reactions, that I had the power and that I needed to lean on something more than me. See, God and I never saw eye to eye for years. When my sister was shot and killed when I was 16, my brother was killed when I was 17, and my good friend was shot and killed when I was 17, I made a pact right then. At 17 years old, the most angriest point in my life, I had been abandoned into the foster care system. I lost everything, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, my home, my aunts, my uncles, my grandparents, my cousins, my toys, my room, my self-dignity, my self-respect, my identity. I lost everything. And then you take away, as I thought, God, you took away my brother, my sister, and my good friend all within a year. And I was so angry. And I made a pact that I would hate God forever. And I went on with life. I owned a multi-million dollar company by the time I was 31. I've been married, I had kids, and God and I still not, did not see eye to eye until the 4th of July, almost seven years ago, this 4th of July, we had our friends over. They were our church friends. I didn't go to church. They always prayed for me, though. And I go, save your prayers. God doesn't love me. We're done with each other. Oh, no, I'm praying for you, Derek. I pray for you, and I invite you to church. Ah, forget that. I'm not going to church. I was a pillar of our community. I uh, did a lot for our community and stuff, but no religion, no Christianity, no God. And we are 20 feet. We, put this, we just bought this home, and we decided we're going to put in a pool, but pools are like $40,000, $40,000, And we're like, well, let's see if we're going to use a pool first. So we went to Costco and bought a four-foot-tall pool above ground. And we're 20 feet away. And my little three-year-old daughter at that point says, Dad, Ellie and I want to go swimming. 
So we put on their life jackets, and they love to go to the top of the ladder and jump in the pool. And we're just talking to our friends. What we didn't know is that my daughter took off her life jacket. Now, my daughter can swim to the side, but her best friend, Ellie, could not swim. And we are 20 feet away, and we're just laughing it up. We had no idea what had just happened. And then their son, Elijah, heard my daughter say, Ellie, where are you? Ellie, where are you? And Elijah came off the trampoline, looked in the pool, and saw his sister at the bottom of the pool. Mom, Ellie's at the bottom of the pool. Ellie's at the bottom of the pool. We run over there. We pull Ellie out. I call 911. They're giving her CPR. They keep asking me on 911, does she have a pulse? Does she have a pulse? No, she doesn't. She is dead. Now at this point, I am cussing out 911. The parents are giving them CPR, giving her CPR. And I am so angry now at 911. It's been 15 minutes. And a month prior to this, my wife started watching some preacher on TV that was smiling and blinking. And I'm like, why do you watch this guy? He's kind of like, well, he's kind of motivational and stuff, but he's too happy. He's always happy on TV. And it was Joel Osteen. <laughs> and she goes, I like it. And I just watched a little bit. And I go, he is kind of motivational and stuff. And, and during this time, I'm on the phone with 911. I turn to my left. And I see the mom stop doing CPR for a second, and I see my wife, who we have no church background at this point, really, or anything, and she puts her hands over little Ellie's head and says, Dear God, please help this little girl to live. Dear God, please help this little girl to live. And little Ellie's eyes opened. And then the ambulance got there, we got her in the, car, in the ambulance. They went to the hospital. The husband and I are driving my car back to the hospital. And I say this. I'm so angry at God. Why would he do this to you? You're good people. Why would he do this to you? I'm so angry. And my friend, who makes about $40,000 a year, humble guy, happy guy, says to me, Derek, if he's... God takes away my little girl, I will praise him. I will praise him. And then I realized in that car, I'm sitting to a man more powerful than I. A man with faith. A man with love for his Savior. And I had so much bitterness. And as we got to the hospital, they called the pastor, the pastor's there, they called the congregation to fast and, prayer and, and do prayer and they go in, the dad comes out and is just crying on my shoulder. He says, they don't know if she's going to live. She has too much water in her blood and in her lungs. They rush her to Oakland's Children's Hospital, and later on that evening, we get a phone call from the parents. She's not going to live through the night. The next morning, the little girl's eyes are open, and she's alert, but she's not talking, and we're thinking brain damage, but she's now off the oxygen machine. We lost cell phone, uh, their battery must have died or something. But later on that night, 28 hours later, I get a knock on the door and I'm like, who is this? And I open up the door and there's that little three-year-old girl, Ellie, going, hi, hi. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I just cried. And after they left, I went up in my room. For the first time in a long time, I got down on my knees and I said, I'm sorry, God, for cussing at you. I'm sorry for leading people astray and maybe, maybe doubting that you love them. I'm sorry for all the things that I've done to you and, and to your, your, your sons and daughters in this earth. And then I heard a voice out loud, deep within, that says, Derek, I never abandoned you. You abandoned me. And then... It was like a flashback in my mind. I could see all the places he was in my life. So I chose right then to write a second book called I Will Never Give Up on God Again. From feeling abandoned by God to feeling embraced by God. My life transformed from that moment. 
I've been married 21 years. I got four kids. I live a blessed life now. What I thought was once a curse in my life became one of my greatest blessings. But you got to turn that test into a testimony. That fear into faith. That try into triumph. Everybody's got a story. This is his story. I saw a homeless man Something told me to talk to him Maybe he'd understand All of my pain that'll hold within He said life's not fair Why do we suffer here And the tears don't fall What's the use of living when there's no one to call? He looked me in the eyes I swear I saw the light And then I realized How blessed I am Hey mister, I'll pray for you I pray for love to touch your heart May your weakness become strength So you find the light in the dark I pray for you Oh, pray for you So here's his story He ran away from a foster home The drugs and alcohol Stole the life of a 15-year-old He never knew his dad And his mom never wanted him She was into drugs and not her son A broken generation So, mister, I'll pray for you. I pray for love to touch your heart. May your weakness become strength. So you find the light in the dark. I pray for you. I pray for you. Shared my life with him And how close we really are And how my mom and dad gave up on me My life's been hard I saw a man cry that day He grabbed my hand With hope in his eyes I saw a new man And he said to me He said to me Hey mister, I'll pray for you Mm, Pray for you Everybody's got a story And so many have pain But what we do with it matters Will we lose or win life's game? So John Brown University So I'll pray for you Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Thank you.